Thank you uh, all for coming to this uh, discussion about what do business interests want under uh, the current and prospective global governance regime. Uh, the genesis of this panel is uh, when David asked me to put some program together for this conference, I looked through the agenda about what was being discussed and who are the various people participating on the panels. And I said, so David, where, where's the private sector? Uh, he said, well, why don't you draw up an idea? And um, I thought back to my time uh, 30 years ago when I was a trade negotiator in the White House uh, and previously on Capitol Hill. Uh, the latter during the writing of the Omnibus Trade Bill of 1988, which is still essentially the law governing trade policy in the United States. And then in the White House as the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative negotiating the WTO and, and NAFTA. And the process by which trade negotiators and investment negotiators work uh, is to consult with different interests to make sure that when we develop our negotiating positions, uh, we are representing the, the US public writ large. Um, interestingly, the advisory group that I had advising me, because I was in charge of the services negotiation, the creation of the General Agreement on Trade and Services, which then became part of the WTO, and also as the lead negotiator for the US Bilateral Investment Treaties, uh, as well as a member of CFIUS, which was an agency which was not very well known back then, but has now become finally a household name. Um, I had a trade advisory group chaired by Hank Greenberg of AIG and Don Reed of Citicorp. Uh, and those are the businesses. But the NGOs, consumer groups, and labor were consulted frankly, more idiosyncratically. Uh, and clearly, as no surprise in, in any government, when you're negotiating, you listen a lot to the business interest. But for two reasons. One, uh, you want to make sure that the agreements that you're committing your government to, uh, that the businesses will abide by and indeed support. And equally importantly, that uh, have, they would have buy-in into these rules so that when uh, governments of other countries were out of line with their agreements, usually the businesses are the canaries in the coal mine to come back first and let us know when these were not working well. So that was the genesis of, 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 of this panel. Um, I recently joined uh, Berkeley Research Group uh, four months ago as a partner and, and uh, the chairman of the emerging markets practice, which is a cross-cutting consulting and expert witness practice. And um, the, the you know, theme for me is to look at how businesses in the current environment, but more importantly, prospectively, uh, deal with challenges and opportunities. Whoops. What I want to do is set the stage by looking at what is top of mind of most businesses, whether it's investors, private equity investors, corporations, uh, or others. And what has happened, as this graph shows, is that there has been a structural shift in the pattern of growth in the world economy. Uh, as you can see in these lines, that the rate of growth in emerging markets in terms of gross domestic product has been larger than advanced country GDP by a factor of two. And that factor of two has basically been invariant to the business cycle. That means that businesses looking for growth opportunities are increasingly looking at emerging markets. And we know that the mature markets, the advanced countries, the US, European Union, Japan, you know, they're not going to grow more than 2 to 3% if, if, if we're lucky. But in emerging markets, that's, you know, on average, uh, much higher by a factor of two. And included in this definition of emerging markets is uh, 
is the IMF definition of all emerging and developing countries. So it's you know, from the South Koreas on down through the Chinas to the Indias to the Burundi. So it's a wide swath of countries. That's the first, I think, setup for the discussion is that there's been this structural shift. And what that means is that US companies or companies in the EU or Japan are clearly after growth and they are not necessarily only so much interested in what's going on in the mature economies, but what are the policies in these emerging markets and how can they leverage their governments to have those governments, the emerging market governments, put in place policies that help them uh, do business. And what's even more important, I think, than looking at this, at this shift of growth is what's driving the global economy growth. So these pies, the size of the pies, represents the size of the global economy. And luckily, the size of the pie has been increasing over time. If it were shrinking, that means the world economy was in recession writ large. Okay? But what's interesting is that not only has the share of growth accounted for by emerging markets now surpassed the share of global GDP than advanced countries, but emerging markets are account the growth in their shares is increasing over time which means that they are the ones, the emerging markets are the ones that are now the engines of the growth of the global economy, right? That's a very important insight. Um, and that means, as I said, that businesses uh, based in the advanced countries, I think have, have um, perhaps divided loyalties because um, they want to not only continue invest in the home countries, but also in these host countries emerging markets. Well, today uh, we, have a, we have a terrific panel cross-cutting businesses and, and, and the public sector uh, with us, I think, to have a great conversation. To my furthest right, not, not speaking through party affiliation, is Don Rosenbaum, who's uh, Berg, excuse me, who is the general counsel of Qualcomm, Joanna Shelton, who is the former deputy secretary general of the OECD and former State Department official, Colin Bladen, who is the former dean of the Tuck School at Dartmouth and also heavily involved, uh, like me, in private equity investing. And then Jeffrey Rosen, who is the deputy chairman of Lazard. So I think we have a very nice uh, cross-cutting uh, group here for a discussion. What I think I'd like to, to pose to, to the group to kick off the conversation, and I really do hope not only will the panelists talk with one another and take on questions from each other. And, but I, clearly, we're going to open it up uh, quite soon to the audience to have a QA. and a you know, What I want each of the panelists maybe to think about is when we think about this backdrop of growth and how it's changed the pattern of growth and the location of growth, what do you see from where you sit as what are the drivers of your objectives, your business objectives, or your policy objectives in such a scenario, which is very different than what it was a decade and a half ago? And secondly, what are the ways that you position your organizations or your thoughts in order to maximize your opportunities and mitigate your risk? Because clearly, emerging markets generally are much riskier uh, places in which to invest, though I think it's questionable whether or not that, that their net returns are necessarily lower than in the mature economies, but there clearly are risks and that's a major issue, I think, for, for businesses. The last thing I will say is that we are, in my view, uh, we are in a, a world today where we're not just dealing with risks, <coughs> conventional risks, political risks, corruption risks, and the like, but we are, at least in the, for the first time in my career and lifetime, in a world of sheer uncertainty, pure uncertainty, a stochastic process, at least with respect to the United States, where decisions are made one day and then they are changed the next day. That makes it very difficult to navigate, I think, in this environment. And to be able to talk to your US trade negotiator to get your voice on the table, how much confidence do you have that what you tell him or her is going to be translatable into a position that they take. Don, would you start off? 
Sure. Uh, so a couple of uh, preliminaries. Uh, I am the general counsel of Qualcomm, um, but I also have worldwide responsibility for government affairs, which puts me uh, spending most of my time, frankly, talking to governments around the world. I've done that for about a dozen years now. I was uh, Apple's general counsel for a short time before Qualcomm, and I was general counsel of IBM, where I had spent uh, 31 years before retiring. So I've got that kind of um, background, uh, both technology and international um, involvement. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, as the general counsel of Qualcomm, uh, and you probably know that we are in the midst still of uh, several interesting issues around the world, as I've told Harry, uh, when I originally agreed to this, I was thinking Chatham House rules. Uh, that's clearly not the case here, so you will forgive me for being somewhat circumspect and maybe even uh, a little limiting, limited in what I uh, will say. I'll try to parse my thinking before the words come out of my mouth to see if I can uh, walk that line. Uh, so to Harry's first question, actually, Qualcomm, this is the only area that's fairly simple for us. Uh, we follow manufacturing from the um, licensing side, sales from the licensing side, and we follow uh, skills on the semiconductor side. For those of you who don't know, just assume our business has basically two arms. One is uh, licensing our patent portfolio, which today is well over 100,000 uh, patents and patent applications worldwide. And um, we uh, make, used to only make the modem chip, the connectivity chip in everybody's uh, device. And now we're a leader as well in the application processor, uh, which is combined with the modem chip and several other uh, elements of uh, processing and communication. So two lines of business. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, the, the manufacturing of semiconductors has basically moved outside the US to Asia. Uh, the largest uh, company that's, uh, that's doing that is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor in Taiwan. Samsung is probably the second. Uh, China has its own um, emerging, I would say, uh, but, but uh, uh, established a semiconductor business. And here in the US, as you know, we have Intel, making Intel chips, essentially. And there are a couple of small facilities. We actually use Samsung's uh, foundry facilities in Texas and um, Global Foundry's facilities in New York State, which used to be IBM's facilities. So I know them well. Um, but uh, for the most part, we and everybody else in this industry relies on uh, Asia for uh, production of products. Uh, it's also the case that um, probably today, this is an estimate, half of the cell phone device, we call them cell phones and other related devices uh, that are produced in the world are produced, well over half actually, are produced in Asia. Um, Apple, as you know, makes its phones in uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, so in a set, in, in very clear and direct sense, we have to deal directly with their, what are called contract manufacturers, the four companies, largest one being Foxconn, who makes uh, the iPhones. So as I said, we, don't, we, we are there because they're there. Uh, and we uh, collect our, our royalties uh, from uh, companies that sell devices. That's our, that's our um, methodology, if you will. Uh, and um, we sell our chips uh, to companies who make the devices. And even Apple, as I said, who probably accounts for 40% of the uh, 40 to 50 percent of the market here in the U.S. By the way, there are only three uh, companies that uh, sell devices essentially in the U.S. It's Apple, Samsung, and LG. Two Korean companies and Apple. Everybody, this maybe five percent, seven percent of the uh, sales are from various uh, Chinese and other uh, device makers. But as I said, Apple makes its phones in in uh, in Asia, so we have to deal through their Asian facilities. So so it's easy for us, as I said, we go where the the manufacturing is, we go where the uh, device makers are so we can collect our royalties. Um, and we also, frankly, as we consider patents we file worldwide, and we're a leader filing not only in the US, but in strategic areas around the world, which when I first got to Qualcomm about a year into it, I created something called the strategic IP function, which was separate from the patent function, which was designed to analyze the best uh, filing um, capabilities uh, which included where, and the where 
uh, includes, by the way, things like what kind of rule of law is established in a particular uh, venue where we might file, because if, if I can't enforce the patents, it probably doesn't pay for me to, to file them there. And then, of course, as I said, we follow the, uh, the makers uh, and the sellers of those devices. So choices are easy for us in terms of um, how we engage. But as I said, it's clear from my description, uh, a big, big part of our business is Asia. Uh, revenue is well over 60% coming from Asia. So we are very dependent on that. And uh, I'd say of the, again, approximately 300 or, or more licenses to device makers around the world, uh, probably half of them are, uh, are Chinese device makers, most of which you've never heard of, uh, most of which sell exclusively either in, exclusively in China or perhaps China, India, and some of the other um, neighboring um, Asian countries. So in your governmental affairs function and, and your general counsel function, you're obviously, like, like many multinationals operating in, in multiple jurisdictions, but heavy, heavily in Asia. Uh, but obviously, you're in dialogue with the US authorities, with the various Asian government authorities. And how, uh, if you can, you know, how do you manage that kind of dialogue that you know, helps Qualcomm's bottom line in these multiple jurisdictions? Um, very carefully. Uh, <laughs> It's similar to what I was alluding to as I, as I sat here and gave you my introduction. Um, uh, we obviously are talking to the authorities in Beijing. We're talking to the US authorities in Washington. We're talking to the authorities in uh, Korea, in Taiwan, uh, in Europe, several countries, as well as the EU. And we're bound to, uh, as I go there and I talk, I'm always uh, thinking about who am I offending as I'm trying to um, to communicate with the particular party I'm, I'm speaking to. And that's become more and more difficult, as you can imagine, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and China. It's always been a little difficult. It's been particularly difficult over these last few years, um, uh, in particular because, as I've indicated, we are quite dependent on the business that we have in China. And like so many companies, um, one of the things I don't think has been touched on enough in, today, in yesterday's and today's discussions, and it's been spectacularly informative for me, um, is that there's a compulsion to have to do business in China uh, on the corporate side. You cannot avoid, if you do, you're, you're going to get tossed out of your, your company. Your shareholders won't accept it. If the market is so big and vibrant and growing in China, you can't simply say, like Google did a long time ago, uh, I guess I, won't, I just won't do business here. Uh, that was a fleeting thought of ours when the NDRC, which was the price regulator in China, it's their comp one of their competition authorities, now merged three of them into one. But the NDRC was the price regulator. It literally, that's its title. It's a price regulator in, in China. And it, and it used the new anti-monopoly law <coughs> to file a complaint against us in 2013. It was one of the first complaints under the anti-monopoly law, excuse me. <coughs> And one of the interesting things about their statute, unlike ours, is that it, uh, it literally says you may not um, excessively price with no definition of what that is, which <laughs> leaves the, uh, the authority to decide what's excessive pricing. And they decided that our royalties that we charge for our patent licenses to Chinese companies was excessive. And that was the basis of a year and a half of uh, my time and others going back and forth in many, many meetings with the NDRC to try to negotiate a resolution of that, of that concern. And I'll touch on that a little later when we get into so it, other matters. It, it sounds like you need an economist to define what excessive is, right? Particularly in a non-market economy, which is no... You, you might also want to teach that to Judge Koh in San Jose. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably, we're, we're trying. Probably, see, I, I went over the line. <laughs> Jeffrey, let me, let me turn to you to my sure. extreme left again, rather yes, than my extreme right. Which is not a political statement. Which is not a political statement. But maybe you can describe sort of what, how Lazard handles these kinds of questions. Sure. Uh, Lazard is uh, both an investment bank and not an investment bank. What do I mean by that? Um, we are not an investment bank in the sense that, let's say, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, and so forth are in that we don't rely on financial capital to create a competitive advantage for us. Uh, we rely exclusively on intellectual capital, which means 
we're exclusively an advisory firm. There's two sides to Lizard, incidentally. There's an advisory business, the, the investment banking business. That's the part of the business um, in which I participate. And there's an asset management business. Uh, that's on the other side of a wall. I should say Chinese wall, but for purposes of this discussion, <laughs> I won't. Um, but it's a, it's a regulatory wall. We're very strict about making sure there's nothing, uh, there's no interaction between the two sides except at the very senior levels of management simply because we don't want, we want to avoid either side of the business being compromised by engagement with the other. On the asset management side of the business, I think when we last disclosed, and if my memory is faulty, you'll forgive me, we are near the end of a quarter, so I can't give you things that are current. I think when we last disclosed, assets under management were roughly 230 billion. Um, of that, curiously, one of the largest components, I think it generally varies between a quarter and a third, uh, are assets um, invested in what Harry has called emerging markets, a point which I'll come back to a little later on. Um, on the advisory side of our business, uh, we advise companies on um, strategies from a financial perspective related to how they develop their businesses and whether those businesses can be developed successfully through different capital structures, different capital raisings, mergers and acquisitions, selling businesses, and so forth. And we have a variety of variants within that theme, but let's call that primarily the exclusive theme. Uh, on that side of the business, my guess is, uh, I'm pretty sure, the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of our revenues have and are expected to come from developed markets. What do I mean by developed markets? Uh, they're North America, uh, Europe, um, Western Europe, uh, China, sorry, Japan, Australia uh, as the primary ones. Um, around, let's say, a small percentage of our revenues have and are expected to come from what Harry has defined as emerging markets. Uh, we have a presence in almost every one of those. Uh, we have a presence in a number of markets in South and Latin America. We have a presence through a local office uh, in China. We have a presence in India, we have a presence in Singapore, and through what we call a sovereign advisory business, which is advising governments, government agencies, and NGOs on, simplistically putting it, their capital structures uh, and their strategies for development. We also engage in business in the Middle East, where we do have an office, uh, and in Africa, where we don't. So we're extensively uh, engaged in emerging markets, but we're not really expecting a lot of growth to come from them. Why? I think the primary reason for most of them is, for now, there are a lot of uh, barriers, let's call them barriers to entry, restrictions on either how we can conduct business in those markets. For instance, in China, uh, we're able to conduct cross-border business, uh, but we don't have and we haven't sought a license to conduct domestic transactions between two domestic companies or securities transactions where we advise but not, don't participate as an underwriter or a distributor of securities transactions in the Chinese market. Now, I'm not sure our ability to have that license might be different than, let's say, J.P. Morgan's or Morgan Stanley's because of the capital that they bring to the market to do that. But equally, for a lot of our clients, these are, and this is where I probably have a slightly, slightly different perspective than, um, uh, than Harry does. I think it is near top of mind for many companies on their wish list, further down on what's practical. And what do I mean by that? Many companies see the opportunity in China. They see the scale of China. They see the opportunity in India. They see the scale in India. Um, and what they found is the most effective way that they can exploit those opportunities is through, if they have a local subsidiary there, to do it that way, uh, to export to those markets to the degree there aren't restrictions on imports into those markets, um, uh, through possibly intellectual property transfers, if they're confident that the intellectual property will be respected domestically and not ripped off, joint ventures, if they're confident that they can be structured in a way that's satisfactory to protect their interests, both economic interests and intellectual property interests in those joint ventures. Uh, but the old-fashioned way of identifying, as you could in Europe, as you could uh, in Canada, 
um, a company that you might like to acquire because it suits your strategy and it could be acquired in markets like India and China as being the biggest ones is a much more challenging proposition for our clients. And therefore, what we found is it's near top of mind intellectually and on a wish list. It's much further down as a practical matter. Uh, and the last comment I'd make, just um, I said I was going to comment on your, what, what I found is um, I, for 10 years, I was on the board of a British company with global interests uh, called WPP. Uh, and I remember Martin Sorrell, who was, until a couple, about a year ago, the chief executive, left in some, I, I was off the board by then, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> left in some spectacular circumstances, which are yet undisclosed. Um, uh, Martin Sorrell was a very early advocate of participating in a lot of these markets. In fact, what he liked to talk about was a year after he set up the company, in 1988, he took his entire board to Hong Kong and then to Shenzhen. A, those of you who know what China was like in 1988, you know what Shenzhen was like. It's not like the Shenzhen of today, nor was Beijing like the Beijing of today. He took his board to Shenzhen because he said, we have to be present here. And over the years of strategy, he put consistent emphasis on, he called it the BRICS, and then he called it the second seven, and the third seven, and so <laughs> forth. But curiously, he never called them the emerging markets because he felt at some point it did them a disservice as to where they were, were in their economic development. And he, in the last few years that I was on the board with him, uh, he made the same point. Uh, it's for others to say, my hunch is if you told China you're an emerging market, uh, they would look at you askance because they're not. They're, they're not a mature market. They're a growth market. Uh, India might find themselves in the same position. Much more, let's call them immature markets in terms of the structures and so forth of doing business and whether there's the rule of law and we can have the debate about the Chinas and Indias might more properly fall into a traditional definition of emerging markets. But what we found, at least in our business, is we have to be a little careful about how we refer to markets in interactions with them for fear that by calling them an emerging market, we risk offending them as much as complimenting them. I'll stop there. So let me, let me just comment on that as, as, as someone who's uh, worked on the ground in China since 1993, um, and Orville is also a, obviously even more of an expert in China than I am, but uh, without casting aspersions to the Chinese, they love to be called a developing country when it suits their interests, sure. and they love to be called a growth and mature country when it suits their interests. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid about, you know, sort of having that conversation with them, because I know that there is that, that schizophrenia there, to be sure. But what I, what I think is interesting from what you said, Jeffrey, is essentially, boils down to you judge or your clients judge that the net returns risk adjusted in some of these emerging markets are just not high enough to make the leap, if you will, or gravitate towards those markets, despite their higher growth, although China is, which we can talk about later, I think, and for very significant trouble growth-wise from its own internal reasons. But is that a fair... Is that a fair yeah, I think it's... Yes, I think it depends upon what you include in the calculation of risk. Correct. Um, and when you put all the risks that you associate with it, the sort of risks that you face in negotiating with these, it's not just the normal economic risk sure. that you face in going into an economy, it's all the other risks. What's the risk of corruption? What's the risk of theft of intellectual property? What are the other risks associated with it? Uh, you back out. And what are the risks that there's such a heavy um, uh, foot of local government interference or control or influence that it's not possible. So I'll just give you one interesting illustration. Um, Walmart had a very ambitious, uh, we've done some stuff with Walmart over the years, Walmart had a very ambitious international strategy for many years. And the international strategy led it to making significant investments in Brazil, significant investments in, um, I think at one point they had a foray into Russia, they had a significant investment in South Africa, uh, they had a significant investment in China. Um, in almost every one, and they had a significant investment in Mexico. The only one of those investments that survives, and if you believe what they say, is likely to survive as it exists today, um, is Mexico. Every one of they've withdrawn 
substantially from Brazil. They've taken a China business in which they had made a heavy investment and they've uh, merged it with another company in China, reduced their exposure, and to have local ownership as part of it. Um, South Africa still exists. My guess, not knowing anything of what they're thinking might be, is five years from now, it wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't exist in the form it is today. They might share ownership with it, with the local public markets or with another corporation and so forth. The only market where it continues to exist is Walmart, uh, sorry, Mexico, and the curious thing is the market where they have put down a stake is India. Uh, they bought a, um, <clears throat> as part of an overall push into e-commerce, which they started in the United States through acquisition. They're buying, I think, the largest uh, ownership interest, it may be 45%, it may be 60%, 60% in a company that I think is called Flipkart in India. And they're making a substantial investment to doing it. And obviously they're taking a view that they can figure out a way to navigate the complexities of India and that it's a somewhat more open market for those complexities than they could in any of the markets I've described. Interesting that you mentioned Walmart in South Africa because I was an advisor on, on that transaction right. where they, they bought 14, uh, they bought MassMart, which was the yes. Walmart of Africa, and immediately got into entry into 14 different countries. And the Competition Commission issue was paramount in that conversation. Um, I won't comment as to whether Walmart handled that conversation well or not. Um, I do think actually they're going to be a big player in, in Africa, but I, I take your point. Colin, um, great mixture of private equity, sitting on lots of boards, and a dean of the business school, and an expert witness. What's your take on this? Well, uh, Harry, one of the things in looking at this program that fascinated me was Adam Smith. And my question to you this morning was, you know, where is Adam Smith in our discussion here today? Uh, and then I'll look back. I'm, as Harry mentioned, I've, I've sat on a lot of boards. I serve as an expert witness in a lot of uh, disputes, and I'm very involved in the world of private equity firms. Uh, private, like Adam Smith, missing from this discussion so far, uh, the private equity firms are basically missing from the conversation at this conference. Uh, and they are a big, important, and dare I say, even still emerging uh, piece of both our economy and of the international economy. And they are different beasts mm -hmm. when it comes to their governance, uh, when it comes to their associations with regulation, law, other things. And interestingly, they don't have shareholders, most of them. Uh, they have investors. They raise money uh, from big pools of money and invest it for them. Uh, they don't have shareholders. They are private, so there's not often a lot known about them. Uh, the ones that have gone public, they do not raise money in public financial markets to put into their investments. When KKR desperately wanted to have a public security, uh, they took a fund they were in they owned in Europe and transferred the listing of that, which was a publicly traded security, to the, the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, I've never, I'll never forget being called by the Wall Street Journal and saying, you know, God, they've gone public. I mean, how much capital did they raise? And I said, not one penny. They didn't believe me. They, they ignored the comment in the article they wrote about it. It was all about them going public. So why did they go public? Well, it really is for the liquidity of the founders who were also the senior managers, and it gave them a currency perhaps to transfer their control and ownership. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. We'll get into why I think 
private equity needs to be an explicit part of the conversation here because I think they're a good illustration of what this conference has been talking about. Uh, the other reason for introducing Adam Smith, I think, into our conversation is that uh, 250 years later, um, the issues that we are dealing with are the issues in some ways that while the context has changed, are the same as when he was dealing with it. Namely, what's the nature of you, mm -hmm. you, of me? Uh, a lot has changed about our understanding. We don't need an artificial, any longer uh, independent spectator to remind us that part of our nature is sympathy, empathy, concern for others. Uh, we've now got even neuroscience and brain imaging that says, you know, uh, what he's talking about, what maybe the prefrontal cortex, uh, and the evil actor is our amygdala, and we carry both of them with us as we go through. And what he was talking about is how do you operate in a world where all of us as actors in it have these behaviors that are programmed and are part of who as just human beings we are. Uh, so I get involved in that partly because of a very different uh, world I live in which is at the medical center at UCSF, which is a fabulous medical center. Uh, and I survived a 10-year bout with cancer. And the result of that was because I had been treated, at one point they showed me the list, I had 22 physicians who were treating me they're required when they're developing new drugs in their labs or new treatments in their clinics uh, to have an official patient advocate. And so I am the patient advocate. And twice a month, I sit with the research teams at UCSF and listen to what they are thinking about and what they're delving into. And what they're delving into in precision medicine, in the way cancer works, in the way our brains work, has been transformed since I was a patient and then became an advisor to them. And I just saw those, that kind of thinking and concern popping up throughout this conference. And so, and I think what Adam Smith did as he recognized a lot of that. A lot of things have changed. Uh, and, but his basic, the issues he was basically dealing with uh, are the ones he addressed in his writings. And so I just wanted to bring him back into our conversations. The other thing is um, we talked about a lot of different things. Once upon a time, I ran uh, a systems integration company that designed control systems for semiconductor fabs. Uh, I uh, actually uh, ran something that uh, was an advisor and on the board of a major conglomerate that was mentioned earlier, LTV. And as the lead independent director, I got the opportunity to dismantle it and having it pocketed by Wilbur Ross. Uh, and uh, so I've seen some of the things we've been talking about. Not that that's what I'm doing now, and though I love the historian's comment that, you know, uh, he spoke to dead people mm -hmm. and the futurist who said he spoke to imaginary friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my history is hard to let go of. Uh, but I want to look to the future. 
And the private equity world, I think, is a particularly good example. Many of those firms are uh, only in the US. They will not go. They do not have to see a China imperative. Uh, their investors can go to someone else who wants to invest if they don't want to. And they, are, they know what they're specialized in, and they go there. Uh, the ones that are international, they make themselves international organizations in different ways, depending on the kind of business that they want to be involved in, uh, in Asia, in Europe, wherever. And they structure their partnerships in very creative kinds of ways to be able to integrate those things and to have the knowledge and understanding they have to be able to operate. And they're not just investors, and they are certainly not advisors, except in the sense to the portfolio companies in which they are investors, and then often they can be even controlling advisors, if you will. Uh, so what it means to be actually own and managing the enterprise as opposed to advising it uh, gets to be in, in a very blurred border. Uh, so they're, a, they're good examples of the, of the enterprises, the organizations that we're talking about at this conference here today. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because uh also having been in the private equity business, um, what has happened for those private equity firms of which mine was a part of was solely in emerging markets is that they have decentralized their decision making to those geographies. So very different than a corporate form. Uh, and I remember talking to David Rubenstein about this. They had, a, they had a failed set of investments in Russia and China because they tried to have their investment committee decisions back in Washington in the, case of, in the case of Carlisle, but they ultimately began to uh, uh, decentralize those decisions to China. And I then asked him, so how do you govern quality control and make sure you know, that you're keeping with the overall Carlisle uh, corporate ethic, as it were. But I think, your, I think your main point, which is really important and it quite resonates with me, and I know with Joanna, is we're all humans in the end. And the decisions that we make and our interactions with governments, uh, yes, we have shareholders we have to worry about to be sure. We have markets that we have to worry about, but how we behave and our, the underlying interest groups are, are comprised of, of humans after all, right? And those are the ones that ultimately, whether they're workers or consumers, we have to sort of worry about. And I know that, um, you know, Joanna has spent a lot of time at Montana and in her previous career thinking about this and maybe you might table some, some comments in that regard. Well, thank you. And uh, what I'd like to do is just give you a brief background of my own career. Um, I began my career at the US Treasury Department as a trade negotiator during the Tokyo round of trade negotiations. Uh, and then had, was also handled Japan at the Treasury when kind of Japan was like China today. So. I think it'd be interesting to have a separate discussion about where might China be in 10 years, given some of the challenges they face. But that is a separate question. I moved to Capitol Hill, the House Ways and Means Committee, where I both wrote trade legislation. I wrote a big part of the 1988 Trade Act, uh, and also implemented trade agreements. Uh, the House Ways and Means Committee is the first stop in the US Congress for any trade agreement coming to Congress for approval. And there I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Trade Policy and Negotiations um, and worked on NAFTA, worked on U.S.-Japan, worked on investment, and then moved uh, to the OECD in Paris where I was the Deputy Secretary General with a very, very wide portfolio doing competition policy, fiscal policy, trade, agriculture. Uh, I launched and ran the work on corporate governance that became principles of corporate governance. and so. You know, in my career, I've had a great deal of experience of trying to integrate the interests and the views of various stakeholders and then try and find consensus among them. Um, so what I'd like to do today with that background is kind of step back and take a, a sort of big picture view of the question before us. 
um, and others have said it during the past day and a half, but it does bear repeating, and that is that it's very clear we are at, a, at an inflection point in the uh, system of global governance that has prevailed since World War II. Um, as Harry said, confidence in the rules, in the system, and confidence between countries is now weaker than I think it has been in the post-war period. And some of that decline in confidence certainly comes from the very unpredictable American political leadership that we see. Some comes from the challenges posed by large non-market economy players in the world, predominantly China. And then some of that um, uncertainty and instability comes from other factors. But I say that the net result of all this lack of confidence is tremendous uncertainty, or as John Kay said yesterday, radical uncertainty and um, uh, certain instability in the system. Now, effective leadership in crafting global rules requires an environment in which other countries will follow or at least take part, take, take the lead, follow the lead of uh, what has in the post-war period been the United States. Um, and uh, they voluntarily take part in negotiations because they believe it's ultimately in their interest to do so, or they believe that being left out will potentially harm their interests. Now in this regard, I would note that China holds the record for the length of time that it took to negotiate its terms of entry into the WTO. It took 15 years. Russia is second at 12 years. And what that shows is that China really wanted to become a part of the system of global rules that prevailed at that time. And we've talked previously about how that has benefited the Chinese economy <coughs> tremendously. And I think we're now facing a challenge because China seems to be moving, doesn't seem, China is moving away from those norms and trying to kind of craft its own path. Now, I think everybody in this room would agree that the United States has lost, or perhaps more accurately, has thrown away the leadership role that we have played uh, in the trade and economic arena uh, during this administration. But that said, even a new administration coming in is going to face some of the same problems that have led to the election of America's most populous president in the uh, modern uh, history. And we've discussed some of those problems already. Uh, those problems include growing inequality in the United States, um, a loss of a sense of community, a decline in innovation, and other factors. But any administration also must confront growing public distrust of globalization and its institutions. And this is, of course, not unique to America. This is true, I think, around um, the globe. And that's why, in the spirit of Adam Smith, and how can we have a conference here without <coughs> mentioning Adam Smith, and his sense of morality and justice, I would argue that we need to do more than just take into account what business wants out of a new global order, but also what does br broader society want or need, even if it is very difficult to articulate what those interests might be at this particular moment. Um, I think many speakers have already noted, and I think we all observe uh, in our own lives, that the financial and corporate sectors, particularly in America, but I think elsewhere as, as well, have in many cases become divorced from some of the foundations outlined by Adam Smith. I think we need to try, if we can, to restore more of a sense of shared interests, corporate interests, and societal interests, or I think we will see a worsening of the trends that have brought us to the point we are today with the growth of populism and nationalism and a breakdown of liberal market economies. So the question is, how do we get to a new global system, whatever that might look like? Well, let me first say how we will not get there. I think it is very clear that there is little to no prospect of these large, multilateral trade and investment negotiations uh, 
in today's world of divergent interests and paths among countries. Um, within the first two, one or two years of the beginning of the Doha round in the, in the WTO, I sat with a group of uh, fellow former trade negotiators in Washington, and I said, I don't think the Doha round is going to succeed, and they disagreed strongly. And I said, the reason I don't think it's going to succeed is because I don't think that there's enough business or political interest in the United States to bring about our own um, support for it. And other countries also had their own uh, political impediments. And as we know, the Doha round, after 15 long years, failed with a whimper uh, more than a bang. And the situation today is worse than it was then. So that's why I think these large, wide-ranging, multilateral negotiations are not likely to be the wave of the future. Now, related to that, I also um, believe that the large multilateral institutions created after World War II will be less influential in the years to come. Partly that's because private equity and private capital has largely uh, supplanted and overwhelmed the capacity of the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, to lend uh, either for balance of payments purposes or for infrastructure. Um, uh, but also just because I think that uh, we do see countries moving in different directions and in some ways trying to pull themselves away from those, those institutions and have more independence. I'm certainly to be sure in saying this, the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO are going to continue to play a role, but as I say, I think that role will be a uh, diminishing one. So where does that leave us? Well, in the short term, I think we might see some uh, progress made through regional organizations or through international technical organizations. For example, after the United States pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, <coughs> Japan took the leadership role in forging an agreement among the other remaining countries. Um, we have technical organizations such as the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Customs <coughs> Cooperation <coughs> Council, the Financial <coughs> Action Task Force, which deals with, uh, tries to combat money laundering and terrorist financing, and it's a group headquartered at the OECD. And that brings me to the OECD. Um, I do think the OECD remains a useful forum for country experts to share ideas and to look at policy approaches across the member countries and even non-member countries, because there's a great deal of interaction with China and other non-member countries, but to find out what policies have worked, what haven't worked, and how can they maybe apply them in their own um, countries. So the reality is, despite the failure of these large, global, uh, wide-ranging international negotiations on trade and investment, there's a great deal of lower level technical cooperation and information exchange that still exists in these other bodies even though it does not get much publicity. Um, in the larger term, I think the, um, in the longer term, excuse me, I think that the current jockeying between the United States and China must, and, and that, that challenge in particular needs to play out further before we can begin to identify areas where we might move forward collaboratively or at least reach some modus vivendi where we can uh, allow the two systems to coexist without a lot of future conflict. And I certainly would add my voice to say I hope that climate change will become one of the areas where we can restore some collaborative efforts. But I'll end where I began and say that I think that we need to give more than lip service to the fact that too many Americans and too many workers of advanced OECD economies are not sharing sufficiently in the gains from their country's broader prosperity, or they are actually losing ground. Um, now this problem implicates tax policy, education and training policies, infrastructure development, and other domestic policies that have virtually nothing to do with trade policy. But they relate to trade policy, the problem relates to trade policy, because many Americans believe, and I think with some good reason, that the global system of rules is driven by business, for business, and leaves aside 
the broader societal interest. And we heard that in the previous uh, discussion talking about corporatism as perhaps a challenge that we are facing. Now one example, I, I wouldn't want to leave you with just a, a, a general statement like that. I'd give you a specific example. I took a close look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement when it was under negotiation. And I came to the conclusion, given my OECD hat, that the intellectual property rights provisions in there were anti-competitive in my view. They would have protected pharmaceutical uh, company products. They would have made generic drugs more difficult to bring onto the market. And thus, these provisions would have negatively affected the provision of drugs and health care in the United States and other TPP countries. Now it's very significant <coughs> and not surprising at all that those provisions were dropped out of the uh, new sort of TPP that was adopted by Japan and other countries. So I'm gonna close with a point that I've made many times before and I think it is um, uh, increasingly relevant in the uncertain world that we live in today. And that is that a strong middle class is essential for a strong democracy. Now to answer <coughs> Orville Schell's question, a strong middle class does not guarantee that there will be a democracy, although even China began experimenting with democratic elections at the local level uh, some years ago, and they're moving away from that. No guarantee it'll lead to that, although I will say when I did a, a, a survey of countries a number of years ago, and this is before the current weakening of democracies, but Singapore stood out as the one exception to that rule, that where in countries you've had the development of a strong middle class, you saw the overthrow of authoritarian governments. Singapore was an exception. China remains an exception um, today. But, you know, the American dream, the belief that if you work hard and if you get education that you can advance and do better, is something that has driven America forward in good times and in bad. And so I think unless we as policymakers and even here I'd say in corporate governance circles begin to take wider account of some of the other um, uh, interests at stake in uh, our uh, economy and companies, when we lose that dream, then I think America and the rest of the world will be worse off. So I, I th thank you very much, Joanna. I, 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 unfortunately share your pessimism about the uh, continuance of these multilateral organizations, even if you have quest even if one has questions about their effectiveness in years past. But it raises the question in my mind, again, just ver from a very parochial business perspective, that businesses care about the rules of the road being uh, obeyed and clarified and importantly and, and the world is globalized, where therefore we would need multilateral rules or globalized rules, without them, what that means for businesses is a terribly inefficient way of dealing with government seriatim, right? Mm -hmm. And we then blow up economies of scale and economies of scope. Um, and so th that why, that's why I'm left wondering so who is going to be the demandeur uh, to our to our government officials to say, listen, the world is uh, you know is globalized now. Maybe it's going to be a bifurcated globalized world. That's a very, in my mind, a very open question. Um, but you know, for so long, maybe maybe businesses have not recognized how valuable establishing those global rules of the road have been. Uh, and then if there is, in fact, a breakdown. Now, we've got the two largest economies of the world. China and the, and, and the U.S. are working outside the WTO. Let's be clear. Yeah. In my view, that, that China is in broad legal violation of its 2001 accession agreement, to which you referred, mm -hmm. and, and which I've, I've written a lot on. And challenging the Chinese bilaterally and with tariffs is not going to change a thing. Uh, in fact, it's going to be regressive on the, on the U.S. economy. And so you've got the U.S. outside the WTO, you've got the China out, Chinese outside the WTO. Um, it seems to me that, again, from, from a pure, if you're, if you're a worker and you care about your business surviving, you're an investor, you're a shareholder, 
you're a member of the management team or a board of a, gov of a company, as you look down the road with this breakdown, um, where you've had this reliance and advice from your governments uh, in terms of policies, you know, you flash forward five years from now, it, it strikes me that we're in, we're in for pretty tough times. And so I, I just wonder from a, from a business policy perspective, you know, what, what does that mean? I mean, if, you know, luckily for Don, you're relatively concentrated in, in if I may, in sort of one region you know, of the world, but then you've got other companies that are very, you know, quite diversified, and without going to uh, a U.S. trade representative, uh, frankly, not the current one, but a previous ones who understood this, um, I just wonder what the, what does that mean for the global for global prosperity, if you will, or do we have this breakdown into you know lots of regional and bilateral um, governance issues? Well, let me just uh, take a crack at that very, very large question. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. Right now, it's very difficult for businesses, but I think one of the re reasons that uh, the Doha round, for example, didn't succeed, and I, I, I think uh, business hasn't shown as much interest in the multilateral, is simply because they have been so successful. We've had basically a set of rules that have worked up until fairly recently. I agree with you. China is in violation of its WTO commitments. Uh, we are too, um, the United States. Um, but um, I, I think that um, just lost my train of thought. Um, I, I think what has happened is business has um, had the rules that have worked, and in the United States, we've got trade laws that have allowed it to pursue you know, Section 301, et cetera. They've been able to pursue discrete problem uh, problems that they've had and solve them pretty readily. Now, I, I personally, as I said uh, in my remarks, I think that we're going to have to have a period of shakeout here. I think things are going to have to get worse before they can get better. I think we're in an era now where we look at cyber theft, cyber uh, uh, actions. Uh, I think at some point there's going to be an imperative on part of governments and companies to try and come together and say, okay, you know, is, there, is there any way we can have some kind of rules of the road here and um, craft some some common approaches, but uh, my sense is, and we're hearing it somewhat today from our business uh, representatives, businesses basically want to know what, is the circum what are the circumstances on the ground, and we'll try and deal with them as we find them. Uh, however, where there's a lack of rule of law, that is a fundamental problem. Um, but as I say, I, right now, uh, I think you're more likely to see uh, <coughs> just more discreet uh, agreements and very specific uh, uh, sector issues um, and where we are going to go then in five years, I think, is, is very much an open question. Yeah, no, I think I you're think right. I yeah, I think you're, I mean, I think the, I think you're right. I think the, the utility of public policy is tough enough under this scenario that we're living in. Um, it's even tougher in the United States when, to be honest, you know, we, ha we have a, a White House that you know, literally is saying something one day and saying something the next. So what, one might throw up one's hands and say, so what is the point of public policy under, under this scenario? And then in Great Britain, uh, we, have, we have another dysfunctional government. You don't have to look in many other places in the world to see very similar situations. Did you want to say something, Don? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I have uh, actually several things I was thinking about, but I don't, I don't know that I'll be able to get to them all. Picking up on this point, a, a couple of things. One, I would say, um, <clears throat> let's, where this, this focus on China, it's fine, but there are, China's not the only, <coughs> the only issue here. So I'll give you a good example. Um, we have a, bi U.S. has a bilateral trade agreement with Korea, of course, South Korea. <coughs> and uh, there's provisions in that bilateral trade agreement which require Korea, when it treats U.S. companies in their investigative bodies with the courts, to provide due process uh, that's uh, defined, in my view, because I help initiate that provision in the, in the trade agreement, as things like access to the full record when you're being investigated, being able to cross-examine witnesses in an investigative hearing. Uh, and I sat through seven days of hearings uh, in uh, South Korea after the uh, Korean Fair Trade Commission 
uh, followed the NDRC at China investigation uh, and decided to bring their own investigation of our licensing policies and then a complaint against us. And there was nothing, if, if anybody is familiar with due process, as we are familiar with it, at least here in the United States, uh, there was nothing like due process in that, in that hearing room. Not at all. We, we weren't allowed to see the full record, only selected portions of it. We weren't allowed to cross-examination ex, ex, cross witnesses, and I use witnesses uh, very advisedly because it's not as if it's a witness here in the U.S. court system, for example, or even an investigative body. It was someone who uh, the commission decided was somebody they wanted to hear from, and anybody could get up and make a statement. Uh, as, as several of our competitors or customers who didn't want to pay as much did. And uh, we had no opportunity to challenge the story that they told. And it literally was a story. So um, A, even bilateral trade agreements. B, even con countries other than China uh, find ways to basically ignore the requirements. Now, the answer we got uh, from the diplomatic side and from the State Department side and the answer they were getting from Korea is, well, you know, it, that's, that's due pro we're doing due process. That's due process as we understand it. So that says, okay, next time you're negotiating a trade agreement, let's be very specific about what due process means and, and what it doesn't mean. Um, but it's just an example. Uh, another thing I want to say, and I'm sorry if it's a little off course here, but this has been a great conference for me and my my thinking is constantly evolving, it always is, and I've, I've learned so much and, and thought about a lot of these things. But one thing that, that, that occurred to me um, this morning, two things I'll say. Uh, picking up on Adam Smith and picking up on Neil's uh, reference to the chessboard or chess pieces, you know, I started to wonder, well, you know, um, is China's system uh, better able to deal with we could argue is what deal with means, but control that chessboard mm -hmm. because it dampens down the individual uh, ability to move in a different direction than, um, than the planned direction. And it has to ignore some of the concerns about sentimentality more and, uh, that, that Adam Smith talks about. But maybe it's more effective in that way. And the other, the other thought I had is, I've always tried to not think of things in binary terms or black and white terms. And I think we're falling into the trap these days, not this group, but everybody generally, uh, in the discussion about China of saying it's them and it's us mm -hmm. and it can't, be, it can't be anything in between. And uh, I disagree with that because if, if I'm wrong, then there's no solution here uh, other than one system is going to fail and the other is going to prevail. And I've done a lot of reading uh, uh, about China. And um, I don't know if any of you have read The China Dream, which is a book by a Chinese author, Liu uh, Wing Fu, his name is. And it was, it was uh, published in, I think, around 2010, 11, something along those lines. And if you read it, you see a lot of what uh, President Xi is, maybe Orville, you know, uh, is talking about and thinking these days, I think. And from an American sensibility, it's, it's kind of good and bad, and it's hard to completely understand, uh, in my opinion. Maybe it's just me. But um, fundamentally, the theme is uh, China is the rising 21st century power. That's just a given. Uh, 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 but they're not a power that wants to overwhelm and defeat uh, the US, who is the 20th century power. They want to uh, compete and cooperate and become, uh, uh, while leading from an economic perspective, uh, still be kind of joint leaders of, of the world. Although, this is where I get confused, there's great ambiguity between do they really want to just um, uh, compete or is, is the goal ultimately to, to be the, the, um, the leader? Uh, it's kind of a discussion of hegemony and, and who's, who's going to be the new hegemon. Uh, and um, it's a very interesting book. Uh, but my, my main point is um, I, don't, I don't look at China, and I, I deal with companies in China and Chinese government officials a lot, as some kind of 
I don't demonize China. I, I just I think that they're acting in a way that's predictable, at least uh, under their uh, system, as they're <clears throat> kind of evolving it today. And what we need to do is understand that and see how we can work to find uh, a cooperative um, middle ground between us being able to live within our system uh, and, and they living within their system. And one more thing I'd say is the notion that we, in my opinion, and I'm not an economist, the, the notion that uh, we live in a free market uh, society, that, ev that we're, we're, we're very different than a state-regulated society, <laughs> is, I will tell you, in my view, ridiculous. Because uh, I think it was um, this morning, uh, somebody referenced the IBM case. Uh, I, I joined IBM in right in the middle of that, of, turns out the middle of that case from 1969 to 1982. Uh, 13 years of litigation, up and down the courts. And the fourth uh, uh, DOJ head of antitrust within that 13-year period, he was now the fourth, William Baxter, ultimately dismissed that case in 1982, the same day that they broke up AT&T. They dismissed uh, the IBM case, and the quote was, as without merit. And that lasted 13 years. And it regulated our behavior for 13 years on top of a 1956 consent decree that was the regulatory, if you will, uh, regulator of, of IBM's business for 40 years. I personally ended up getting that, uh, that decree sunsetted in 1996. <laughs> so 40 years of a consent decree that basically, and, and lawyers had to go around the co company all the time lecturing people on what language to use and what not to say and how to conduct themselves because we might run afoul of the consent decree's uh, competition uh, concerns. And today, for example, without stepping over the line I want to step over. We have just, um, uh, the Qualcomm, uh, uh, were ruled, uh, 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 the FTC had brought a case against us in uh, 2017, very three days before the administra administration changed. There were only two FTC commissioners who voted to bring the claim. The third who was there, there weren't five, there was only three at the time, uh, wrote a stinging dissent. But it was filed. It was filed in district court. And just a few weeks ago, the judge in the district court there ruled against us, a, a wide-ranging order against us. And I used to think, uh, <clears throat> back when I was a budding antitrust lawyer, when there were only a few jurisdictions that you really worried about, as opposed to 130-plus competition authorities all around the world now that you have to deal with, 100 and probably close to 140 now, I used to talk about the lowest common denominator problem. That is, as a business, a global business, you, you, have, to, you have to act in a way worldwide um, that, that, that comports with the most restrictive competition authority because you can't act differently all around the world. And so you had to comply with that. And I used to think that would be someplace outside the US. I'm beginning to think now that the US is, uh, is that lowest common denominator. Uh, which is very disturbing to me. Now, there's a disparity, as you know, I think, between the DOJ's view of competition law, especially as it affects intellectual property rights, uh, versus the FTC. But um, all that is to say, uh, we're all regulated. <laughs> uh, and we're all, whether it's direct or indirect, um, and there isn't that, that, um, that freedom that we'd like to suggest that we have as compared to the state-directed economy, and I'm not suggesting that I'm in favor of that by any means. I love our system. It just needs to be uh, corrected to some degree. Um, but it, but it, uh, it, it's, I think, important to remember that it's, it's maybe a way to think about how we, how we find a middle ground, uh, because we have to. I think Can I ask you a question quickly? So start at the beginning of your uh, remarks, the end of your remarks. Which do you prefer, the Korean system or the US system? The 13 years, the, uh, the, the decision handed down. Uh, very good question. question. <laughs> it's a very good question. I, I would just off the top without getting into details, the US system still. <laughs> okay. hey, would I, I would say one other thing too, thinking about the private equity firms that, uh, that I work with a lot. Uh, they've gone into all of these different markets. Sometimes it has not worked. 
They have found other ways around it. They've learned from it. Those countries have learned some things from it. And they've adapted and changed. None of that was predictable. Uh, I, the best example I think maybe I can think of is several of the major private equity firms decided Japan was a great place to go. Uh, and they went there in you know, the, the 1980s, 90s. Uh, KKR established an office there. Carlisle established an office there. They were never able to do a deal, not a single deal. Uh, I gave a speech at the Kinanren invitation and said, you know, the Japanese aren't any different. From, it, was a, it was an Adam Smith speech. <laughs> that you're like us, you're humans, you're, you know, you're smart. And not only that, you guys have all of the things in place necessary to have this kind of vital private equity investing company changing kinds of systems. All the components are there and nothing is happening. Why? And nobody exactly knew the answer. They would say it's the salary man thing, it's careers, it's the shame of failing. And it's disruption. I was it's disruption. And it's disruption. And I was quoted in the paper as saying, you know, I hear all of that, but you know, I, I gotta say, I think it's bullshit. And that, of course, became the headline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were just a good thing. But the Japanese, but the, but the private equity is now active in Japan. That is exactly my point. And they have gone back. <laughs> they have reopened. But selected. And the problem with Japan, to get back to the point I was trying to make, the very beginning. Use whatever words you can. My experience is this: that the Japanese, for better or worse, don't like outside influence. Period. It goes back to the period of Commodore Perry. Uh, they didn't like that. They didn't like what Perry forced them to do. They're tr still trying to resist it. And uh, I've done business in Japan. Uh, there is a and very simply, we've had a number of clients who've identified companies in Japan which they would like to acquire on a friendly, <coughs> negotiated basis. And almost consistently, the answer from both our people in Japan, Lazard's people in Japan, as well as the companies is all very interesting. Uh, a prominent Japanese company will not fall un into the ownership of an American company. And if you look at the examples where it's happened, they're few and far between. And look at what Carlos Gohan is, Gohan is going through now. Gohan is going yeah. through a, a series of things yeah. that relates I mean, to Renault, simply a strategic alliance. Yeah, exactly. It just happened he was CEO of both companies. So let's, we have a couple of yeah. minutes, um, and I think I saw a couple of hands. Um, please. Uh, um, the new global system. Uh, one of the reading that I remember from long ago, Robert Gilson, uh, in the 1980s, the U.S. power, uh, he's a crimson, he wasn't the U.S. power is multinational. He pointed out that the only two eras that we've really had of globalization, uh, late uh, 19th century, roughly 1847 to 1914, Brits dominated, and post-World War II. They only exist because one nation was willing to enforce a system. And you get beneath that, there is no global value. We look at Adam Smith, the Judeo-Christian uh, foundation. Is that world value? I teach a lot in Asia. Uh, what I call the American management system. Uh, Americans write the textbooks, the uh, Asians I teach in Thailand and in China. Good students, they take notes, they'll give back whatever I tell them. But their view is, call it bullshit. This is not how we do business here, it's our way. I think when we look at a global system, there isn't a global system. And we've only had one because the US, and I believe the Bretton Woods system, is a powerful one, but it's our views, and it's not necessarily a worldview. I think Trump and Xi are ships passing in the night. They have totally different views on how things work. And as the US diminishes as a global power, this is where the uncertainty, what does China want? Is it a system that I feel comfortable in? I don't think so. But the system is a, uh, let me end this, what was now saying's comment, power comes out of the end of a rifle, and maybe, we are in the tail end of a U.S.
earned and valued, say, Adam Smith value that will no longer prevail? So I'll just speak to the corporate level quickly, if I may, which is, I think if you look at a lot of the Chinese companies, um, for now at least, they're run according, you know, broadly according to American principles of management, partly because a lot of the people running the companies have either been educated in the United States or have people working for them who have been. And the question is, how do they adapt that, that management system to a very different set of local values that may come out of the Buddhist traditions or whatever the traditions are that differentiate from the Judeo-Christian system? The same, I suspect, is true of India and a lot of others. I, I can't predict how that's going to change in the next 10 years, but I think it probably is closer to an American system today. Okay, let me... A question in the back and then the front. Please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would like to link what uh, John said to uh, his last comment, and um, you know, this needs to open towards uh, different uh, interests, which are not just uh, business uh, and their diversity across the world. I wonder what your view uh, is about Accounting system and regulation, which is very much focused on, uh, you know, maximization of shareholders, value to a very precise and single interest. Um, the, the title of the thing is uh, "What Do We Want in a New Global System?" But the conversation has been has put the word "trade" in there. It's a new global trading system, and I'd like to try to broaden the conversation out to talk about a, a global financial system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, what I'm really concerned about is we've been through a major financial crisis in 2008. We all were traumatized by it. But that created a response of the world's governments more or less acting in concert to deal with the crisis. So you had coordinated action from leaders in the U.S., Britain, and Europe. And we managed to have a sensible response. The chance of a globally coordinated political response to the next crisis is far diminished. I mean, China's role is much uh, bigger than it was then, double more or less, and uh, obviously no basis for cooperation with the US. Britain is crashing out of the EU. So the whole notion of, of uh, political cooperation to deal with the crisis is vastly diminished compared to what it has been. I would also say that the potential for crisis is probably greater now than it was, uh, driven by a couple of fundamental changes. One, the banking system globally has pretty much been regulated out of market-making activity. So there's very, very little capital that's uh, dedicated to making orderly markets in disorder. Uh, secondly, you have so much money that's on autopilot, in effect, uh, indexed or, uh, or controlled by uh, oh. the algorithm. So there's almost no uh, human intervention in the decision making in, in, in so many markets. So I, I think we're in a uh, environment that is much more uh, prone to uh, uh, crises of liquidity, crises of, uh, of market movements all going in the same direction with no countervailing uh, uh, forces and with a vastly diminished ability of the authorities to act in, in concert in a sensible way. So I just wanted to add a little optimism to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll take as much optimism and, as, <laughs> as, as we can get. And, um, why don't we, in reverse order, just maybe just have some closing comments with respect to these questions or anything else? But let's try to frame it and sort of like, you know, where where would we like to go? Like, what a, you know, what's the next step to be try to be pragmatic? Because I think that's what we're we're trying to aim towards. Um, Joanne. Well, let me just say I agree with the, the two comments that came about. Yes, we need a leader in the global system, and certainly U.S. role is shrinking. I agree. The financial risks are higher not much prospect of coordination. In terms of, uh, in terms of where to go, I mean, I do think, you know, touching on the, the third or second question, <laughs> touches on something that we perhaps should, in a very, very concrete and sort of <coughs> micro way, look at, which is you even look, I mentioned that I, you know, launched the work at the OECD on the corporate governance principles, or now the G20 OECD. Those emphasize shareholder value. I think that 
that and the accounting standards, I think that's one area where we could take a look to start changing some of the, uh, the, the ground rules under which companies and, inst and, and uh, uh, financial institutions operate. Where, I mean, I think of Germany, and that was one of the things when we were crafting these principles, looking at the German model, which includes labor and includes a sense of community in, in the concept of corporate governance. And I would argue Germany has managed, except for you know, the former East Germany, uh, you know, tensions there on, on refugee. But I think you know, they've done a decent job of keeping perhaps more stability than some of our other countries. So I think, yeah, let's broaden out some of these rules that, that encourage companies to take a wider look at whose interests are at stake. Because after all, as somebody said yesterday, corporations are a creation of the law. They are not sort of entities that exist under themselves. Thank you. I, you know, I, I would just add to this, having taken part in the corporate governance uh, 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 model that Joanna mentioned and was the first to implement it in Russia, there was an incentive in Russia at that, at that juncture to actually implement them because they wanted investment. And the same thing with accounting. It's not going to be done by fiat. It's if the companies want to get investors, they've got to have internationally acceptable accounting standards. Did you want to? And only one thing. Uh, we're talking about international, about trade, about all of this. Uh, I think a lot of the issues that we're really talking about is the do what we can do, which is fix what we can fix in our own home countries. And because at least some of the disputes and difficulties I've been involved in were right here at home. Uh, and sometimes we reached for protectionist things when I was in the steel industry and other things. We could have done a lot of things about our steel industry. We didn't do them, okay? Uh, and the steel industry, you know, went down the tubes largely. Uh, part, part so, of the yeah. And uh, I wrote a book called, uh, in the early 80s, Education for Tomorrow's <laughs> Jobs. Uh, I got all kinds of things wrong in it, but I got the title right. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the things that we've got to fix. Yeah. And that's on a long list of things. Jeffrey? Um, if I may, first of all, the corporate governance and accounting things, the first, my first attitude is don't try and factor corporate governance, let's say broad social objectives, into accounting systems. It doesn't work. You've got to start with a basic financial picture of a company yep. as a starting point. You can then layer onto it other objectives that a company needs to achieve and evaluate whether they've achieved those objectives or not. But soft objectives can't be factored easily into what is ultimately a judgmental system anyway, which yep. is the accounting system. Corporate governance, th this is, I think we're just entering a period of a broader and broader debate around corporate governance and even more broadly, the purpose of a corporation. Uh, that's an entire session. That's not even now. I'm not sure the direction it's going to take. All I caution in the debate is, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, to the, because the corporate system works pretty well in terms of generating good lives and wealth and security, at least in the United States and in most parts of Western Europe, for a broad number of people. Yes, it could function better. Yes, it could address a different set of criteria and priorities, but it works pretty well. Uh, to Bob's point about um, uh, financial crises and so forth, I'm a little less pessimistic about the coordinated response, only because I still think that, um, I, I don't think there is quite the degree of professionalism at the top of the US financial system, the regulatory system, between the Treasury and the Fed, that there was, at, fortunately, at the time of the last crisis. Without a Hank Paulson, a Tim Geithner, and a Ben Bernanke, I don't know how we would have gotten through that. Uh, they were just remarkably fortunate that at that unfortunate period of time, they were there. Yep. One of the things that's changed, though. Congratulations, Tarkin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every, every, everyone has their flaws. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that I think what, what has changed is I think you do have more central control over banks and their capitalization in Europe with the ECB than you did before. I think the powers of the president of the ECB are better than they were at the time of the financial crisis. I think the challenge of the time of the next financial crisis, if and when it occurs, and I agree with your other factors, 
is if banks need recapitalization, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood that the Chinese step in then if they don't have their own domestic crisis? And I think any crisis in the domestic system with the, within China, uh, China, I think, is still largely a contained financial system. Um, apart from institutions like HSBC, there aren't extensive links in terms of lending and investing with the rest of the world to the degree there are with other financial institutions. Uh, but if, if China is not going through its own financial crisis at the time of a financial crisis in the West, what's the likelihood that the Chinese step in with capital? And how is that going to be accepted politically at a time of necessity? Don, please. I don't want to keep everybody here. I, I okay. Just uh, quickly, uh, the, the thing that I worry about, and it's been talked about a lot in terms of corporate governance, and, uh, is, is this incredible push now toward short-term mm -hmm. performance versus long-term. And it's, it's, I think, extremely damaging um, in, in the long picture. Well, great. Thank you very much. Please give the panel a round of applause. Thank you.